This is what people imagine when they think of Turkey, the cosmopolitan city of Istanbul where Europe meets Asia. Its 14 million residents annually welcome more than 11 million visitors, making Istanbul the fifth most popular tourist destination in the world. Turkey strives to be a moderate and secular Islamic country with a population that is 99 percent Muslim. It's been a NATO ally for decades. The country is viewed by most as stable both economically and politically. But anti-government demonstrations in Istanbul's public square in 2013 and political corruption scandals in 2014 left many wondering where Turkey is headed in the 21st century. Perhaps an answer can be found with this group of Armenian American tourists headed to central and eastern Turkey to visit the land their ancestors lived on for thousands of years. A hundred years ago, though, a million and a half of the two million Armenians living in this part of the Ottoman Empire were massacred or died in death marches. About a half million survived and landed in cities all over the world, creating what is today a vibrant Armenian diaspora. These tourists consider themselves pilgrims visiting historic Armenia. Their pilgrimage will take them places where most residents of Istanbul will never go, cities and villages all over central and eastern Turkey, where those two million Armenians lived in 1915, the year the Armenian genocide began. In the summer of 2013, things were tense and tentative. Earlier in the year, street protests had started in Istanbul and spread across the country. In Istanbul now, small daily demonstrations had replaced the larger ones that had been crushed by riot police weeks earlier. The criticism against the democratically elected government, though, remained sharp. Yeah, Hitler was democratically elected too, you know. The feeling on the street toward Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan remained divided. Also in his party, uh, in the government, uh, in bureaucracy, most of people know that we are right, uh, people are right. But uh, to stay in the power, he has to push forward. He has to raise the tension. That's how he wins. As the Armenian-American pilgrims prepared to leave Istanbul and head east, many wondered if Turkey would continue to embrace Western values, or were the events of 1915 destined to shape its worldview and its political personality. The Turkish government in 2013, after all, put more journalists in prison than any other country on earth. No doubt a troubling statistic to accept for most of Turkey's NATO allies in Europe and the United States. For these Armenian Americans, returning to the land of their parents and grandparents is the trip of a lifetime. It's also an opportunity to travel with Armin Arroyan of Los Angeles that draws many to the pilgrimage. The defense industry engineer retired a quarter of a century ago and began making these trips. He now has more than 70 under his belt, having taken some 1,200 people to more than 600 cities, towns and villages. This Armin Arroyan tour was organized by a Massachusetts-based nonprofit group known as Nasser, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. Along with Arroyan, they brought along Richard Hovanissian, who wrote the book on Armenian studies programs around the United States. In fact, the 81-year-old historian has written and edited more than 25 volumes on Armenian history and genocide, including 12 volumes on historic Western Armenian cities and provinces. A native of California's agriculture-rich San Joaquin Valley, he spent a half century at UCLA, where he's currently a professor emeritus. Every day during the two-week journey, Hovanissian gave morning briefings, short historical overviews of what the pilgrims had seen and what they were going to see. This was the area known as Gasaria by the Armenians who lived here in 1915, part of a region that boasted an Armenian population of some 70,000. And this area has, you know, changed hands a dozen times with uh, different invasions, but the Arabs knew it as Kaiseria, and uh, later the Turks called it Kaiseri, which is the current name uh, of, this, uh, of this region. As you well know, the Gesaratsis are famous for their bastruma, uh, their dried uh, beef, and one of the 
major products here along with textiles, linen, goldsmithing, silversmithing and so forth. And you're seeing all these areas that are torn down and new buildings are being built. These are the old army and quarters. The government is restoring a number of Armenian houses, but they don't identify them as being Armenian. They identify them being historical sites. I'm glad to see that these buildings are being renovated. Uh, just a little segment of what was. You can feel the wealth of the Armenian community here, of the merchant community here, and how great the losses were for our people, not only here, but uh, throughout the country. This is just a little sample uh, of the enormity of what, not what went on, but I am pleased that we and others and our posterity and the locals, once they are able to cope with their own past, will appreciate what these buildings signify. This was once an Armenian church in Kayseri, or Gasaria. Now it's a martial arts studio. The Armenian-American pilgrims would see building after building abandoned, sitting in ruins, or in this case used by those benefiting from the Armenian genocide. We're at the American uh, school in Talas, uh, which uh, was attended largely by Armenian children and Greek children. This was largely a Greco-Armenian town uh, re uh, and a resort because it is right above the city of uh, Gesaria or Kai city. Uh, there were three Armenian churches here, a number of Armenian schools such as the Khubasarian school, Subtoro Segeratsi. And uh, so uh, we see the remnants of old Armenian homes, uh, very nicely built, without Armenians. This is the kind of place Armin Arroyan takes his tours, not a path the average tourist would travel. It's a village called Pinarbasha, once home to a thriving Armenian population when the city was called Azizia. Ermenische Schule, Ermenische Kirche, Ermenische Hammam. My Papa said. His father and mother told him this was the Armenian church, and this was the Armenian school, and this was the Armenian bath. The Ermenian house and so. And this street. This street. This, this street has Armenian homes. We asked him whether there were Armenian writings uh, on, the, on, on the homes at the entrances. He said that they weren't now because they were erased, and they were erased for restoration purposes. This crumbling church is in the Sivas region of Turkey, in Gurun. The city sits between Kayseri and Malatya. Before the genocide, Gurun had more than 10,000 Armenian residents. Now there are none. It's just another reminder of what happened from 1915 to 1923. Kale is a small, pleasant place right between the larger cities of Harpert and Malatya. Malatya and the area around it comprise what some call the apricot capital of the world. In fact, you'll see those apricots sold all over Turkey. The group stopped at this Kale apricot orchard to get a taste of the product and to collect some snacks for the road. During the Armenian Genocide, this area was used as a deportation station for more than 100,000 people. This is Izol. Izol is where all the Armenians from Kharper and other areas to the east were deported, marched, uh, and then they came to the Euphrates River here and were forced to go across the river, where many drowned and others didn't drown, and where people like my father were carried away by Kurds to work. That's the story, which uh, is a part of the sad destruction of the Armenian people. Uh, 
carpet is about 40 miles to the east. They've walked these 40 miles here, and then they crossed over the river, those who could cross over the river, and were deported farther to the south to unknown places. All right. This is the city of Harpert, or Harput as the Turks call it. It's a place with deep roots for Professor Hovhannisian. Harpert and the surrounding area are known as the Golden Plain for the colorful countryside created by vast wheat fields. Before the Armenian Genocide, more than 170,000 Armenians lived in this region. One small village in the region right outside Harpert, or Harput, is Husani. Boston businesswoman Nancy Kaligian had family here in the late 19th century. My great-grandmother Sarah Boyajan lived here in Hisenig. Uh, my great-grandfather Krikor Kaligian also lived here. I don't know where his home was, um, but he uh, emigrated to Boston, worked there for a few years, sent money back, came back to Hisenig. They had another child uh, of six boys that they eventually had, and they eventually came back. Um, to Boston, he was able to bring the entire family before the genocide of 1915. And this year, when I walked inside the house, uh, it was very emotional for me to see because I'm the first person in our entire family that's ever been back to Husanig. Um, so this was very, very meaningful for me. I never thought I'd ever be in this house. I never thought I'd ever get here. So for me, it's really, it's a, a pilgrimage that I will always treasure. Thank you. Bye bye, Esther. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Also outside Harpert is what was once the village of Bosmashen, where Professor Hovenissian's father was born and raised. Hovenissian's daughter, Ani, made the pilgrimage here with her father. This is the village, the home of Babi Kaspar, my papa's papa. And many generations before him. This is the land where they lived and this is the land where they left and from where they died. Nothing left. There is nothing left. This was a village of 3,000 people. Nothing to be said. Francois's grandfather is a native of this village. Nashan Der Sarkisyan, a large clan, and our clan comes from this village and many others. About 3,000 people in this uh, village. All right. This is the book that Karin wrote about his grandfather Kaspar, Family of Shadows, and it starts right here. And it ends right here. And it ends right there. All of us who went to the villages yesterday afternoon and, and yesterday morning, you know, we keep on using these names that we grew up with. I say Buzmashen and Hulakyov and Husinik, but all those names have been removed today. And a new generation is learning other names for all these historic places. These are what we call cultural markers. And when you eliminate cultural markers, it's eliminating the whole a part of the existence of these people. And that's, a, you know, it's not only destroying churches and destroying other uh, uh, monuments and not only rewriting the history, but, you know, taking away even the memory that this was. At this point in the pilgrimage, the Armenian-American tourists found themselves in the heart of historic Armenia, 
From Palu eastward was the core, to Moosh, to Bidlis, to Vaughan, to Kars. The mountains, valleys and plains, the nature of the land, dictated political conditions for the Armenian people. Many uh, of the difficulties of the Armenians deals with their inability to draw together in a, under a single ruler because each of these valleys had its own Nakharar, its own prince. In Mush, before 1915, a third of the city's 30,000 residents were Armenian. In the 100 surrounding villages, the population there was overwhelmingly Armenian. In Bitlis, the land of Armenian-American writer William Saroyan's ancestors, there were once four Armenian churches. And along the shores of Lake Vaughan, there were more than 300 villages with an Armenian majority, up until the genocide. Lake Vaughan is iconic for Armenians. There are four islands in the lake. On one of them, Akhtamar Island, is the recently renovated Armenian church called the Cathedral Church of the Holy Cross. Although the signage on the popular tourist destination is not completely upfront about the church's origins. Not one word of Armenians. Not one word of Armenians. Elizabeth Redgate, a professor from the UK, is an expert on the architecture of the church built in the early 900s AD by King Gagik. She wrote a book in 1999 entitled The Armenians. Some scholars think uh, after Gagik changed sides and fought against the Arabs, this was a way of declaring that um, he uh, was not a traitor, that he was a pious king, a good king, a Christian king, uh, just as pious as uh, his rival Sumbat Bagratuni, who had been martyred. Uh, Gagik himself is depicted very splendidly and in a very Christian way. The uh, sculpture is very complex, it has multi-level meanings. So, for instance, high up on the church, there are scenes which look like scenes of daily life, hunting scenes, vineyard scenes, a picture of Gagik, well, it is thought to be Gagik, cross-legged, holding a drinking goblet. Gagik is in a vine frieze, and vines and grapes are symbolic of Christ. In his seated pose, Gagik is reaching for a bunch of grapes with one hand, and his, his drinking goblet is in the shape of a Christian chalice. So at one level, this is a portrait of the king engaging in courtly culture of an Arab kind, but at another level, this is a depiction of the king committed to Christianity from his gestures. So this church is making great statements about King Gagi Katsruni, and it's making them in very sophisticated, very complex ways through the sculpture, through the frescoes, through the positioning of all of these things, and drawing on the past, the biblical past, the Armenian past. While on the island, a dignitary unexpectedly appeared with an entourage of bodyguards, camera crews, and a Turkish-speaking tour guide. He turned out to be the U.S. ambassador to Turkey. I'm delighted to see an American group come here. As the American ambassador, I'm coming uh, to eastern Turkey. We, we come from time to time. Uh, in fact, I'd like to encourage Americans to see this beautiful country. As you can see, the people are really friendly. I have been in Turkey 30 years ago. I was here in the mid-90s. I've seen how this country has changed and developed. When I came here before, there was no one at this site. Now you see how crowded it is with tourists. 
they've restored the site. Now it's in active use again at least once a year as a church. Uh, I was talking with the governor. Uh, for example, Ahtamar Church, Ahtamar Island, is a very important part of uh, our tourist destination. And we are happy uh, people from Armenian origins to come to see their church. The governor and the government in Ankara want to encourage Americans, especially Americans of Armenian descent who have roots here, to come back. There's been a, there's a sad history, but now they're celebrating the fact that the Armenians were here and they're welcoming the Armenians to come back and celebrate mass and, and sort of make peace with the past, if that's possible. We hope so. Upon the group's return to solid ground, the Armenian Americans did not miss the opportunity to take in the beauty of Lake Vaughan and its sentimental significance. Well, people are baptizing themselves uh, unofficially in the waters of Lake Vaughan. Much of eastern Turkey or historic Armenia is populated by Kurds, not by ethnic Turks. Before the genocide, Armenians coexisted alongside the Kurds on this land for centuries. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh.